Okay, folks, I think we will make a start. So it's a pleasure to welcome you to the final event of this term and the series of, and, and, and the series of seminars that we've organized in order to mark the relaunch of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture. Um, this evening is slightly different from the previous seven weeks. Um, well, previous eight, previous eight weeks, actually, um, as this is our ninth week of doing this. But it was first mooted, I think, um, several weeks ago, particularly when Professor Martin Percy was unable to be with us, that we did uh, initially, I think, for a couple of hours before Dr. Bethany Solorida uh, so I came up with an offer of a paper whereby like, we were thinking about having a panel for that particular um, Monday. We didn't do that, but it seemed such a good idea. And the four people who were initially identified as speakers were all very, very willing to do this. So we decided like, to hold this over until, until ninth week. And so this week, what we're really looking at is spanning of the generations around the formation of the initial centre, that's the Oxford Centre for Christianity and Culture that was founded in 1994. And so our four speakers in this order, and so I will invite them each to, to speak for between 10 and 12 minutes or so. I'm like, it's all a bit of grace here, so we'll sort of, um, um, sort of see how it goes. So I will sort of try not to be too brutal in sort of turning off the microphone, although clearly if they are sort of turning it into sort of sermon mode, and it's pushing way beyond 15 minutes, then I probably will just switch off the microphone and be blown. But hopefully it will come to that. Hopefully grace will abound. Um, and so our four speakers are in this order. Firstly, Professor Paul Fiddes, who was the Emeritus Principal of Regents Park College, and who was the founder of the Centre, the Oxford Centre for Christianity and Culture in 1994. And Paul will be followed by the other Paul, which is Professor Paul Weller, who is an associate director of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture, I believe is an alumni of Regents and also has been one of the longest people associated with the centre, so Paul will speak. And then that will be followed by Dr. Beth Dodd, who is an, who is an associate of the centre and, and is also the programme leader for postgraduate programmes in theology, ministry and mission at Serum College. And then finally, Dr. Pat Brittenden, who is an associate also of the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture. I believe um, that Pat has a DPhil from Oxford, and that was supervised by my predecessor, the Reverend Dr. Nick. Who's fed, who said, I've just forgotten. What's his Nick? Nick? Wood. Wood. Yeah. Obviously, the rule here is try to work from a script and don't assume that everything's going to be retained by your head uh, because at the last minute it will just disappear. Yes, like the Reverend Dr. Nick Wood, and apologies to Nick for that, um, who was my predecessor. And so each of them, in turn, will just give a very personal account about the centre, some of the challenges that it has sought to address. And hopefully, in the Q&A, we'll get an opportunity then like, to reflect on where we think it and where we think that the centre will be going next and for the future of our community. And so without further ado, I hand over to Professor Paul Fidders, who will kick us off. So, Paul, over to you. Well, I'm very grateful uh, to you, Anthony, for inviting me to tell the story of the founding of the centre, which I think may still have some useful pointers in it for the life of the centre today. You can find a fuller account of this in the college history called Dissenting Spirit uh, in the chapter which is titled, I think significantly, Making a Christian Mind. So just a few recollections and reflections. When I founded the centre as principal at the time, the idea for it was that it wouldn't just be a centre attached to the college, as other colleges had various centers, but it would be the center of the college. 
the Center for the Study of Christianity and Culture, as it was called then, was to be the focus for what I envisaged to be the unique nature of the college and the university, its USP, its unique selling point. It was still developing from being a Baptist ministerial college with some non-ministerial students to being something like a small college of the university and it needed a USP. So I saw it as a place which offered opportunities to its undergraduate students to cross the boundaries between their faith and the subject they were studying as well as between faith and the wider society in which these students were placed and in which they were going to work in the future. There were to be opportunities, not, of course, requirements. It was an offer to them. At the time, the college was mainly undergraduate. The buildup of graduate students hadn't happened. A large number of the undergraduates had Christian commitments. Offering the opportunity to develop a Christian mind about academic disciplines and society seemed to be something that regents could do. At the same time, the center would be a place in the university for discourse to take place, to make links for academics between their faith and their discipline. It would create a Christian mind for the wider university as well as for the college. Uh, that approach was laid out as late as 2001, which I now realize is 20 years ago, uh, in my introduction to this book of essays by center researchers called Faith in the City. Uh, faith in the, in the center, Faith in the center. Um, if you'd like a copy of this, uh, I can let you have one. Uh, post free, package free uh, for the sum of 10 pounds still have some available. Now that vision had structural implications for the college. In the early 1990s, you may be surprised to know that all the fellows were theologians. We had lecturers for other subjects, but not full fellows or tutors. So my idea was to appoint college fellows in non-theological subjects who would teach their subject to undergraduates and all be fellows of the center they would model for their students this interdisciplinary approach. There was to be no faith test. It wouldn't require fellows themselves to have a Christian faith, but to be interested academically in making the link between the Christian tradition and their subject and working with theologians on research projects to do this. And so the idea was that we gradually build up a group of stipendiary college fellows, all properly paid in subjects other than theology, who would all be fellows of the center. I convinced the governing body about this, and before we'd even founded the center, I persuaded the governing body and the council in 1992 to appoint a fellow in English instead of theology. And it was written into his contract that he would become a fellow of the center once we'd had enough money to establish it. That was Julian Thompson. And though he was never in the end a fellow of the center, until very recently, he has always carried through the original vision by running undergraduate seminars with one of the theologians linking 19th century literature with 19th century religious movements. We very nearly established a similar fellowship in music. However, the story, as ever, was one of failing to raise enough funds to carry through the whole vision. In the end, the center was founded without any structural link with college fellowships, and we continued to appoint college lecturers and not fellows in non-theological subjects. We began the center with virtually no funds. The first director, Alan Crider, was largely funded by the international ministries of the Mennonite church. Instead of college fellows in the center, we created a group of center fellows, non-stipendiary, of course, there was no money. In recent years, the governing body has decided to rename these as research associates. 
Over the years, they, I think, have been quite extraordinary in carrying the heaviest weight of research being done in the college. We did write into the college statutes that if non-theologians were to be appointed as fellows, not lecturers, but fellows, they must show an interest in working with theologians on interdisciplinary research projects, and that stipulation is still in our newest form of the statutes. Again, this isn't a faith test. It's an academic requirement reflecting the nature of the college. In fact, it took another 20 years after Julian to appoint other non-theological fellows of the college. They weren't, of course, associates of the centre. The weekly lecture series, which was created right at the beginning and still flourishes, has encouraged the linking of faith with a wide range of culture. And I do think that this original vision of interdisciplinarity, especially between other subjects and theology or religion, has continued in the college, though in other forms. And there was another reason than financial why the original vision couldn't be entirely carried through. It was the nature of the student body itself. Over the last 30 years, fewer undergraduates with Christian commitments have appeared. And I am myself glad about the diverse nature of the college community containing those of all faiths and of none. But even when there were more students than now who identified themselves as Christians, the pressure of college and student life meant they had no time to add optional sessions in which to relate their faith to culture. And as it was part of an exam syllabus, it was going to be low down on the list, very low down in most cases. And likewise, the pressurized nature of the ministerial course with students increasingly church based meant that ministerials had no time to get involved with the center. I'd always seen the work of the center as enriching ministerial formation, but practically this was not feasible. As the postgraduate community grew, more links were made between it and the center, especially with center studentships. And I still think there's much more potential for engaging postgraduates, whether or not they're people of faith and whatever faith it is. But the increase in one year postgraduate courses has meant that there are equally issues of pressure of time. And so finally, what pointers are there for today? The present principal and governing body have recently revived the original vision in a slightly different form. They intend that, as well as associates, the centre should in time have fellows who are also non-stipendiary research fellows of the college. Uh, and there's the difference. Originally, the idea was that they will be full stipendiary fellows. And that smaller number would be leaders of various programmes in the centre. That really does seem to me to be a good model, and I hope that we might be able to implement it. The change of name from Christianity and culture to religion and culture seems to me to be our proper learning from experience. The original vision of creating a distinctively Christian mind about culture should not be lost, but subsumed within a larger vision of what Christian theologians would call the kingdom of God. This center needs to foster thinking about the relation of all phenomena of religion to culture in all faiths, and indeed in the secular moves towards religion that are simply often called spirituality. And the emphasis has moved over the years from trying to link academic subjects in college with faith to a, a more freestanding discourse in the center. Under the present director, it's engaging itself in issues of diversity, equality, and social justice. And this, I think, is giving it a strong sense of identity and purpose. I do very much support this. It gives the center a direction where simply interdisciplinarity is a bit vague. But I hope and expect that its dimension of wide interdisciplinarity of religion will culture, with culture will continue and in turn strengthen the USP of the college. In changed times, I believe that the center can continue to be a center 
in the university, but the center for the college. And so on to others. I hear nothing but silence. You're <laughs> muted there, um, Anthony. I think you're muted. A rookie mistake. Obviously, that one is still prone to do. I was um, thanking you for your insight, Paul, and for the historical basis of, of your words and also for your brevity as well. So thank you very much for that. Apologies. And so we now turn to Professor Paul Weller. Paul. Okay. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, Anthony, for the opportunity to say a few words um, in this context. Um, they'll be much more disconnected and less systematic than Paul's, the other Paul's um, introduction to the origins and uh, mainsprings of the center. And I suspect that those who follow me will have uh, much more uh, to offer by way of orientation uh, to the future. But what I'm going to try and do is offer just a few reflections um, from, in a way, quite a personal angle um, on um, involvement in the life of the centre in various ways over uh, a good period of a decade, a half or so. Um, for me, I think I would say that the centre, as I think it has been for a number of others, um, has provided something of a home with all the good things that are associated with being a home, as well as potentially some of the uh, other aspects of it, where in one can get too comfortable if one isn't uh, very careful. Uh, what I mean by a home is, in my particular case at least, um, as Anthony mentioned, um, in the 1970s I was actually an undergraduate student reading theology in Oxford uh, in parallel with the present principle, uh, 74 to 77, um, by various circuitous routes, um, later on ended up uh, working in academic, academia uh, at the University of Derby for many years. Uh, where I headed up the development of a research centre and then postgraduate study of religion in a religious studies mode rather than a theological mode. In the early 2000s, that uh, whole development that took place at the University of Derby in common with a number of things in new, newer universities at the time was closed down. Um, it left me feeling, I think I described it as the time, at the time as something of a beached whale in a wider university that didn't know what to make of somebody who still wanted to research uh, in relation to uh, the role of religion, particularly in my case, um, in public life and in terms of religious diversity. And in the early 2000s, um, I was pleased to have the opportunity to present a couple of seminar papers in the series that Paul referred to um, at the centre and then ultimately in 1995 um, in connection with uh, a book launch of, of a book I wrote at the time on uh, time for change, reconfiguration, religion, state and society. Um, I, in speaking at that book launch, which was hosted by the centre, um, was given the invitation from the fellows of the college to become at that point in the terminology of that time, a visiting fellow of the centre. And in one way or another, with different kinds of roles since then, uh, 2005, I've had an involvement with the centre in that sense of feeling it as a home. <laughs> um, for, in a sense, an academic who was, um, yeah, uh, the beached whale in uh, a different kind of university environment that didn't understand um, the engagement with religion and the importance of it, or didn't seem to at the time anymore. Um, and I suspect that a number of people who've connected uh, with the centre over the years have 
shared that sense of finding a home uh, in it. Not least because although it is uh, a place of rigorous intellectual engagement and mutual challenge, um, as with other things in the context of Oxford University uh, and college life, um, these things take place within a wider environment, within a sense of, in the best sense of the word, a fellowship, um, in which people also share in one another's lives to some extent. Certainly eating together, as well as speaking together, listening together, engaging together, challenging each other in terms of ideas and their research and their uh, impact engagements in the wider society. And so those characteristics, I think, of the centre um, both have been and are and remain quite important ones because they contextualise the thematic and intellectual engagements with the centre um, in a way that I think is quite important for those who have the opportunity uh, closely to engage um, with the centre. Um, so that's the first thing that I wanted uh, just to say about the centre. The second was picking up on the theme of dis interdisciplinarity uh, that Paul mentioned uh, as having been very much at the heart of the centre. And uh, in my case, in a sense, uh, this was not so much um, interdisciplinarity between disciplines concerned with religion in the centre um, of, of focus, uh, whether theologically pursued or in terms of religious studies or social scientific methodologies and other kinds of disciplines such as literature, history, art, etc. But almost the kind of internal disciplinary, interdisciplinary discussion that goes on in the study of religion and is also reflected in developments in the university. When I studied uh, as an undergraduate in the university, the faculty was theology, that was the name. Um, I was a student undergraduate representative and we had a very, very big discussion um, in a board meeting about extending um, the curriculum as far as embracing philosophy of religion at the time, um, not the study of other religions um, as now the present faculty um, uh, as Faculty of Theology and Religion um, embraces. And I think an environment that can um, facilitate and both welcome and facilitate the discussion between different forms of engagement, um, also with the phenomenon of religion itself, um, is something of importance and something that the centre does offer. So I felt entirely able though primarily the inheritance of the center was, as Paul describes it, the formation of the Christian mind, drawing upon in that sense theological perspectives, engaging with other disciplines. I felt quite able and at home to come in and present and offer things from my own much more religious studies methodological approach in terms of professional life and social scientific approaches, and that this was welcome. Uh, but also engaged with in a critical way, in a properly critical way, uh, that I found exceptionally refreshing and helpful because it enabled one to pursue questions, uh, perspectives, uh, that within those kind of disciplinary boundaries, within those particular approaches to the study of religion, uh, are often not allowed uh, to be pursued. So interdisciplinarity also within engagement uh, with uh, religion and religion and belief itself. In recent times, of course, uh, the centre has gone in this transition reflected in its, in its, uh, in its name, as Paul has also mentioned, uh, from the Oxford Centre for Christianity and Culture to the Oxford Centre for Religion and Culture. Um, we did debate actually whether the word belief should be in there as well, religion, belief and culture, uh, because as Paul says, there's been no intent to exclude uh, the critiques that come from the non-religious perspectives and to welcome and work with those. And indeed, we have had colleagues within the centre who have very much, I think, kept those of us who have religious perspectives 
beliefs and belongings um, that are very much part of ourselves have kept us honest by asking critical questions from a more humanistic, uh, in that sense, non-religious uh, perspective. And that, I think, you know, although it's not visible within the title, the present title of the thing, which might seem in some ways to therefore focus much more on religion <laughs> as such, um, I think that dimension of the centre's life has been important and remains to be important. I mean, if we look back over a number of titles of some of the seminar series in recent years, just give you a flavour of them, um, uh, remains to be seen. Um, that was, for example, a series of uh, art installations and presentations, um, not necessarily informed by religious perspectives, but which were actually helping people to think through and engage with issues of meaning and perspective in life. Um, but ranging from that to also seminar series on in-migration, cultural and theological discourses on 21st century movement of peoples, or creative conversations between uh, poetry, uh, theology, and theopoetics, or thinking after secularity, historical perspectives, or religious diversity and freedom, or even historically, picking up now on the strong thematic focus of the center's current trajectory, inclusion, education, cultural and theological perspectives, human rights and racial justice. So many, many different themes have been reflected um, in the center's um, evolution um, over the past few years. One thing that I wonder if in the future we might be able to find ways of doing more deliberately um, and more consciously is something to do with the relationship in our work between um, theory and practice because the centre has always wanted to be rooted in the sense that we are not only engaged in abstract discussions about the issues with which we've been concerned but have wanted those discussions and debates, presentations, thinking, research to be properly grounded. But I wonder how far we've managed to push the boundaries of actually um, doing theory and practice together and whether there might be opportunities in that regard um, in the future. So for example, um, if the center uh, were to have a thematic focus in a particular um, in a particular semester, whether one might find some way not only of debating these issues, presenting them, and so on, but also of building in some practical action that relates to the issues that we're concerned with, and that in turn may also be an opportunity, perhaps, for engaging uh, some students um, in some of those concrete activities. Um, which could bring together theory and practice. And in many ways, that's also uh, consistent with the current kind of trends and developments in relation to research uh, nationally and within the context of the university, where alongside research for its own sake, which remains important and valuable, and many of us stand on the shoulders of those who do that, but alongside research, also increasingly goes under the jargon, uh, the notion of impact. What difference does research make in the world in which we live? How can change come about through the research in which we engage? And so that to me presents a challenge for the center in the future. Um, we wish to be an engaged center. So how can we, can we? Is it possible to do that within the framework of the present centre? How do we extend that uh, so that perhaps uh, we can make more connections um, between theory and practice in our programmatic work? So those are my few thoughts um, in between uh, the thoughts of the founder and uh, the thoughts of those who are now about to present. Thank you very much, Paul, for that. Um, 
And now we move to Beth. Thank you. I um, also just wanted to start off by saying thank you very much, Anthony, for inviting me to contribute. Um, and also to say that I don't to expect to bring any more wisdom to the subject than is already present here in the virtual room. Um, but I would like to make a few observations in the hope of opening up discussion. Anthony asked uh, Patrick and myself to address the intellectual challenges that the centre can and should address. So I'd like to provoke some questions, um, particularly around the kinds of discussions that the centre might foster, the grammar of our discourse, if you like, and how that might best promote the centre's aims as it moves forward into a new phase. Thinking about the key intellectual challenges that the centre might address, I reflected first on the range of topics of huge importance raised just by the last weeks, eight weeks of seminars alone, and Paul's given a broader sense of the, the longer history of that, from post-colonialism to spirituality, the environment, decolonizing church culture, intersectionality and identity, sport and politics. As the centre reflects on its future priorities, I wonder if it might be well placed to consider questions raised by the latest global crisis. Issues of wealth and health inequality, the negotiation between the values of personal freedom and social responsibility, national self-preservation and international cooperation, the constraints surrounding human connectivity, are just some of the issues of acute significance for contemporary culture and religion. Behind these questions, I think, lie deeper issues around the relationship between crisis and cultural change, the contribution of religious traditions to changing cultural values, and how cultural priorities are set as we hopefully move out of a global pandemic, but into most likely a growing ecological crisis. Reflecting on the centre's particular contribution to such major issues, I've become increasingly concerned less about the topics that we might address than the grammar of our discussions. And here, I think what I have to say will overlap um, quite closely with uh, what both Pauls um, have brought to the table. As the meaning of culture has evolved from, in Raymond Williams' terms, a standard of perfection towards a whole way of life, from a civilizing force to a unifying power to a manifestation of plurality, a marker of identity and a site of contestation. So conversations around religion and culture have been variously conducted along the spectrum with conflict on one end and symbiosis on the other, passing through dialogue, correlation, accommodation and assimilation in between. Building on this scholarly hinterland how might we speak into the intersections between religion and culture in a way that best promotes the center's aspirations? Aspirations not only towards the important work of description and interpretation, but also the contribution of research and scholarship to the promotion of human flourishing. Aspirations towards an ethic of equality, diversity and inclusion through attentiveness to marginal and marginalized voices within an environment of religious, cultural and disciplinary diversity. As a centre associate, I've perhaps most appreciated the exposure to unfamiliar topics, ideas and methodologies that have shifted my own research in sometimes subtle, sometimes palpable ways. Given the continued siloism of much academic life, the centre's interdisciplinarity is both a blessing and a challenge. Alongside the usual difficulties facing interdisciplinary research, such as the task of cra crafting some kind of comprehensibility, coherence and relevance through divergent methodologies and for a diverse audience. Alongside these sit more fundamental questions of methodological ethics. How diversity might be encoded within structures of debate. How marginality might be honored through alternative forms of discourse how imagination and creativity might be seen as fundamental for fruitful boundary crossings between cultures and religions. A focus on equality, diversity and inclusion 
requires us, I think, to consider not only what voices are missing, but how those voices might be better heard. The challenges of constructive conversation in the context of diversity are real. In a time when religion and culture are often mobilized for so-called culture wars, how might the work of the center interrupt strident debates with empathy and nuance without failing to call for justice and transformation? To create the kind of space for this work requires, I suggest, particular conversational practices. We might learn, for example, from interreligious and ecumenical models of dialogue, from the language of hospitality derived from Levinas, the receptivity of Paul Murray, or the phrase popular with scriptural reasoning, improving the quality of our disagreements. Or perhaps the intricate, intimate, and deeply effective interrelationships between culture and religious experience are better understood less as dialogical and more in terms of hybridity, conducted in Homi Baba's third space, or what Michael Jagasar, a research associate here, has called creolized spaces which open up new vistas for constructive dialogue with, between, and among perspectives, moving towards a more holistic model of transformation. What might such creolized spaces look like in the interfaces between religion and culture? Could Mikhail Bakhtin's notion of polyglossia re represent the kinds of intellectual coherence towards which we might or perhaps what Virginia Burris has termed heteroglossia in her post-colonial perspective on the glorious babble of Pentecost in Acts 2, a language in Burris's words, textured by contingency, split or doubled by the awareness of other tongues, spaces, and temporalities. Vietnamese American poet Ocean Vuong has said that the future is not in our hands, but in our mouths. As we reflect on the center's contribution to the promotion of human flourishing, we might think about how our scholarship could be informed, not just by the topic of marginality or the interests of the marginalized, but by marginal forms of discourse. How far does inclusivity stretch in the context of an academic paper delivered in sight of the dreaming spires? Although not obviously at the moment. Where and how are the voices of resistance heard? I think the orality of Vuong's phrase, saying the future is in our mouths rather than in our pen or in our words is significant. The bodiliness, the ephemerality of speech, its ritualized forms, the role of character and presence in performance, all have epistemological implications. How might the center's work remain attentive to what Carolyn Cooper has called noises in the blood. David Ford has called the cries of the world and Ruben Alves has called signs which are too deep for words, inarticulate groans. How might we remain open to the ways in which the inarticulate and the unarticulated connect with the inarticulable, the silence or the transcendence at the heart of human speech? My final reflection on the grammar of our conversations arises out of Rowan Williams' invitation last week to consider the value of the arts to contemporary discourse on religion and culture. Different forms of language open up different perspectives on the world. So dance, drama, poetry or music are not just illustrations of analytic truths, but distinctive ways of knowing. The Oxford Center for Christianity and Culture has long incorporated the arts and alternative methodologies into its work. How might imaginative and creative forms continue to be embraced, not just as a commentary on, but as fundamental to thinking about religion and culture? In his epic poem, The Five Quintets, Irish poet Mikhail O'Shiel writes of the poet's depth and breadth of view that lets the future in our now unwind. How might the center continue to invite imaginative depth and breadth into its conversations, drawing insights from the past into reflections on the present, taking the risk of openness towards an expansive vision of the future. As this term has shown, 
the intersections between religion and culture have never been more important. Building on the center's significant work to date, as it moves forward, I think we will need to continue to reflect on our identity and purpose, learning how best to honor the R of religion in its new name, or while remaining alive to the changing meanings of the sea of culture. The center has long embraced diverse methods and discursive forms, and I'm sure will continue to do so. As we address the issues of our time, how might we continue to reflect on the what, who, where, and how of our discussions in ways that might not only contribute to the quality of the center's work and the fulfillment of its, its aspirations towards equality, diversity, and inclusion, and inclusion, but also making a profound contribution to reflections on the nature of the relationship between religion and culture in general. Thank you very much, Beth. That was fabulous. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And finally, we move to Pat. Well, uh, thank you, Anthony. Um, like Beth, thank you for the opportunity to contribute um, to this um, discussion. Um, I think you'll hopefully see quite a bit of complementarity and overlap between what Beth has shared and what I'm going to share. And uh, that was quite organic. We did compare notes, but we didn't sort of co-write this. Um, so I'm encouraged by that. I want to begin with a few reflections um, uh, on my own narrative and what I've particularly appreciated about this place. And then I'd like to explore some questions related to the identity and mission of our center, because it seems to me that any discussion on what areas we should consider focusing on going forward has to come out of who we are and where we think we're going. Um, and then I'll finish by suggesting the areas that I think we should be engaging in, in the context of a place like uh, Oxford University and at a time like this in our history. Um, I've um, particularly appreciated and benefit from what I will call the unpretentious and welcoming nature, or to put it in the langu language of, of virtues, the humble and loving place this has been to be nurtured as a very, very junior scholar. And in the work of the center, what has been most notable uh, for me is both, as we've heard already, the pluridisciplinary fields in which uh, our scholars operate and also the, the potency of, of critical reflection applied to questions not just of intellectual concern but of uh, great contemporary significance. However, at times, or if I'm honest, really quite often I've wondered where are we actually going, if anywhere, as a collective community of scholars or if, as I suspect, being on different journeys in our work or ministry or scholarship, then what brings us to this place? What common purpose underpins our koinonia, which is the, the word that Paul used earlier? I suppose I'm asking this ontological and, and teleological question because I think it has significant bearing on the core question that Anthony asked Beth and I to address, namely, what are the key intellectual areas and challenges that we might or should be engaging with um, as, uh, as a center? And my thoughts have coalesced around this vision that is our center becoming a leading place to engage with issues of social and cultural transformation in the margins. I'm trying to explore the implications of what a focus on EDI, equality, diversity and inclusion actually means, or as a collective of scholars in different fields, if we actually have a common hope or direction or telos for our center's contribution to key issues at the intersection of religion and culture. If we are trying to facilitate or spark transformation or liberation, then what might that look like and in whose image will that be? Um, if it's a case that our activities as center seek to go mere, beyond mere intellectual inquiry, regardless of the theocultural and so so social context in which we live, that is, you might say, just you know, learning for learning's sake, which I quite understand is a legitimate telos for a place like this, and rather, if we consciously see our place in a dynamic of conscientization, to use Paolo Freire's term, then what kind of conscientization will this be? Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed is, I think, uh, uh, although it was written quite a long time ago, still a challenge to a place uh, and a center like ours in an elite place like Oxford University. Might we consider our telos uh, to be a place where we learn to perceive social, political and economic contradictions and to take action against oppressive elements of reality, to use his words. 
in contemporary terms, we might call it a woke approach. But I do not mean poli mere political correctness or populist woke rhetoric, uh, which simply mirrors whatever is trending on social media. No, that is precisely the opposite of what I'm talking about. What I'm referring to is the more authentic sense in which woke originated, namely the conscientization towards injustice, inequality, and discrimination in the Black Lives Matter movement. More specifically, I want to make the case that the center ought to be focused on praxis in the margins. You heard that word margins in best talk, and you heard this idea of praxis in what Paul uh, Weller was saying. We might talk about us becoming a leading center to use Peruvian missiologist Samuel Escobar's phrase of critical reflection from the periphery, or better still, use Korean American theologian Jung Jung Lee's notion and talk about us being a place of self-affirming marginality. Uh, Lee challenges the, the, the classical uh, self-negating definition of marginality, which assumes a structural separation between a dominant and a subordinate group in society by introducing a self-affirming conception of marginality, not defined by the dominant group at the center he suggests that marginality is a nexus where two or three worlds are interconnected, an open-ended and unfolding horizon where others come to meet and then go away. So my question to us is, might our center be this kind of place in the margins? Whether or not such an approach that deliberately seeks uh, to encourage transformational practice, praxis in the margins is the same or similar to Anthony's prioritization of equality, diversity, and inclusion, I'm still not sure. And that is partly because I'm not sure what the main telos of such a, an EDI focus is, whether related to black, Asian, and minority communities, or to LGBTQ+, or persecuted Christians, or believers, uh, Christians from a Muslim background, which is my field, or whichever context of dehumanization and discrimination, what does liberation really look like? For Jung Jung Lee, transformation in the margins centers on Jesus Christ, in his words, the ultimate marginal person. And true humanity only occurs through self-affirming marginality. And therefore, authentic conscientization happens in the image of the God-man Jesus. As a practicing Christian, this is the true humanity, to use uh, Karl Barth's terms, that I have in mind. However, since as a center we've moved from being defined by the intersection of Christianity and culture to religion and culture, can this really be a shared telos? If the center's mission is not defined by such an obvious Christian hope, then perhaps it should aim to be a nexus at the margins of interreligious engagement with culture, with the aim of mutual enrichment, shared values, and perhaps trying to work towards a common hope. I guess I'm asking this because I'm excited about the direction of our center becoming a place that honestly and robustly deals with a range of EDI issues in a post-colonial and post-Western context of world Christianity, and indeed an increasingly post-Christian context of the West. But I'm concerned that our engagement of these issues goes beyond mere intellectual inquiry, as uh, Paul was hinting. I would like to see the center grow into a place that is more than an echo chamber for these contemporary issues, however intelligently they're expressed, but rather is guided by a theological mission of conscientization. And so here is the rub. In whose image would this conscientization be? The full praxis transformational implications of, of Paolo Freire's conscientization is clear and I think compelling. However, the interesting thing about him is that despite being a Roman Catholic, his approach is actually fundamentally secular. It's the kind of secular pedagogy of liberation. It owes much to the philosophical traditions of Marx and Gramsci, Hegel and Sartre, it's a naturalistic autonomous approach that ensures that humans not only learn to think for themselves, but also entails that they depend totally on themselves. And I have an issue with that. If personhood is understood theologically as participating in the self unveiling of God as Father, Son and Holy Spirit, as our very own Professor Paul Fidus has written, then the transformational implications of Ferrere's conscientization might better be viewed as a kind of theologi theological praxis uh, transformation. It might be closer to Gustavo Gutierrez's theology of liberation. That is, 
critical reflection on economic and socio-cultural issues in the life and reflection of the believing community as it acts in the world. And so finally, I think we need to consider, and, and already Beth has hinted at this, the paradox of our place in the University of Oxford in a post-Brexit Britain. Centres are not by definition centristic, but implied in their name and purpose is the task of bringing people together in a place of influence at the centre. And this place is the University of Oxford, which if we like it or not, and I would venture to say that most of us do like it, is an elite centre of academic excellence with a long-standing and worldwide reputation. So how can we ensure that we keep the focus on conscientization and praxis in the margins. This is a little bit facetious, um, but I wonder whether we might rename ourselves, having just already renamed ourselves, the OCMRC, the Oxford Centre in the margins of religion and culture. Finally, if we are serious about such a direction for our centre, then we also need to think innovatively about our reach and influence. The COVID pandemic has opened a world of possibilities for increasing our reach and engaging a much wider range of voices from the margins. I don't have time to expand on this now, but along with Bethany's idea of, of starting a YouTube channel where we could post or live stream talks and discussions, I think we ought to, ought to consider recording podcasts of varying lengths. This might be through interviews or roundtable discussions with those who are presenting. Notwithstanding the investment in technical know-how needed to record these on a regular basis, the multimedia format would be a relatively simple way to enable the themes that we explore to be shared and experienced much more widely, and especially with those in the margins. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. That was excellent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, um, let me just do a bit of jiggling here. Uh, spotlight. Yes, as is our custom, um, if you have a question, please put it into the chat box. We've already got a couple already. Um, I would like to start. So let me just. Um, so this is for all four of you. I mean, I, I should have said that if you if you want to pose a question to one particular individual or to all four people, then please do so. But do make that clear um, as you are sort of scripting your question. But I think to kick us off, this is for all four of us. Um, all